Jim Stewart back at you again with a, another dose of historical tonic for fragile white folks. This particular segment is an explanation of how this tonic works. First thing that's important to understand is that this is not African American history and this is not another discussion of slavery. It's not African American history because this is a history of white folks. It's a history of white folks that illustrates what I mentioned to you in the last lecture that white folks represent and generate a white supremacist law of gravity unless they do something to oppose it. And the world that we're going to be re-entering as historians is the world that's a lot more like the world that killed George Floyd after 1865, not before 1865. The modern world of what we like to call sometimes race relations begins when African Americans are freed and have to struggle for the rest of the history in the United States to make that freedom and that equality real. The law of gravity is what they battle against, and that law of gravity is also something that shapes and determines African American historical memory about what it's like to live here. Why do we want to know this history? Well, I suggested that already that learning it, learning this tough stuff, toughens us up. It allows us to develop some muscles to redirect our law of gravity someplace in a different direction. It gives us insight, it answers questions about where, we, uh, where our problems come from, and it shows us the courage to be able to respond to them. Now, I think it's important to understand when we're not talking about Ameri uh, African American history and we're talking about the history of white supremacy, we are talking about very difficult, often very violent events, incidents, and trends. You have to be able to sit down and steel yourself in a variety of different ways in order to be able to really take this in, and that's the challenge. Owning this history means that one has to begin to extend, like any good historian would, their feelings, their thoughts, their reactions, the imaginary pictures that you paint in your head about what it would have been like to live back then. What it would have been like to not stand in their shoes, because we don't do that. We don't go back into the past and relive it again. We try and understand it through what you might call empathy, or what you might call compassion, or what you might call wisdom, or what you might call insight, but whatever it is, there's something in the past that challenges you to understand what happened so that you can understand yourself today better and to decide what, if anything, we are going to do about the situation that's facing us when it comes to the racial crisis that we have today. I would like to observe that being able to internalize the history this way allows a person then to begin to make some moral choices or ethical choices in their own lives. We're not big people. We can't stop redlining all by ourselves. We can't do things that involve discriminatory um, sentencing by simply walking into City Hall and say, change this. That involves tremendous amounts of work, and the work that's involved today is something much more difficult in its own time, even than abolishing slavery was. Slavery was, and then after the end of the Civil War, with certain very important modifications and exceptions, was not. Those were laws, those were amendments. The Jim Crow era ended with civil rights legislation, pieces of law that are applied to public life. Today, by much different terms, we are discussing something much harder called systemic white supremacy. You don't change systemic white supremacy by passing one more law. It seems to me that the challenge of our time, as opposed to abolishing slavery or challenging Jim Crow, is the idea of challenging ourselves, our own attitudes, and our own courage. Doing that means having the guts to stand up and understand that systematic change, systemic change, begins when a person like me disrupts my own life, not asking legislators to disrupt a system, but asking oneself to move in a different direction. If you do that kind of choice making, you don't need permission, you don't need an invitation, nothing about a crisis is driving you, no wake up call. If you start small with yourself, you can do things that seem very disruptive, 
but can be done. I can testify to the fact that they can be done. You could, for example, decide to do your shopping where black people shop. You could decide if you wanted to, that if you want spiritual nurture and community, attend a black church. If you are involved with asking where your privileged resources should go, join a black nonprofit, donate to black causes. And most important of all, and this is so involved with the cliche of saying some of my best friends are black people, makes my teeth grind when I hear this because if you have real African-American friends, you're never gonna say that. If you befriend as a consequence of doing any of these personally disruptive uh, things, uh, get to know African-American people as people. You'll stop seeing black people as them and black communities as there. When black folks make progress, you'll share in part of it. When black folks encounter tragedy, as we've done with George Floyd, as we're doing again now in Kenosha, you'll be able to reach out with personal support. Because when the next atrocious assault happens on a black life, you won't have to ask how to help out. You already will be helping out. So that's the reason for the tonic. The history gives you the chance to see yourself as an actor in the present by being able to actively interrogate the past. Past and present always talk to each other. We always ask the question, why did this happen? Now, if you wanted to literally ask the question, why is white supremacy here? You'd find yourself then transported to 1619 in the coast of Virginia. A deep historical question about the origins of slavery. We don't have to do that. We can start in a world that's recognizably ours, 1865. And the tonic will work if we also remember and imagine. This is something I do all the time, and it, it's both challenging and unnerving and often kind of fun. I imagine that someone is watching me from the past. The idea that people in the past could look on you in the present is a fiction, of course. But what if Ida B. Wells was sitting next to me, listening to what I'm talking about now? Do you know who Ida B. Wells was? I'm sure you do. She was born in 1863 in Nashville, Tennessee, and she died in 1835 in Chicago, Illinois, in 1935 in Chicago, Illinois. Last year, she was awarded a posthumous Pulitzer Prize for literature. Among her many accomplishments as a investigative journalist and activist, Ida B. Wells, born in slavery, emancipated at age three, spent the greater part of her life investigating, reporting on, and protesting against the mass murder of African-American people in the South during the age of lynching. She wrote books about it. She toured all over the United States. She ended up going to England. And the Chicago Defender, the Chicago newspaper that employed her for such a long time, uh, really was a beacon to African-American people to develop their sense of that present and past. That, if you were to read the Chicago Defender, you'd be reading her and you'd be reading the words that create the historical memories in the minds of African-American people walking up and down the street today. So our historical muse will be Ida B. Wells. And later on, I will remind you from time to time uh, that she's listening to us, encouraging us, and watching us. Mm -hmm.